please stand. Then let us recite the gospel acclamation. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As in the past two Sundays, an extremely long gospel reading. Please be seated. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, but rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Mary and her mother, sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. You are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. And after saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. And Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to the fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. And when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming in. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here. He is calling for you. And when she heard her, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And the Jews who were there with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. And so the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you? that if you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward, and he said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you 
always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Then the other Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. This third reading from the Gospel of John is a continuation of what we have heard in the past two weeks. You will recall two weeks ago the rather phenomenal story of Jesus at the well of Jacob, and he's thirsty, and he is approached not only by a woman, by a Samaritan woman, pointing out that what Jesus was up to was not going to be closed just in the land of Israel, but spread out even among those people who were seen as the enemies. So in approaching a Samaritan woman, he begins a new walk into the lives of people that would never have thought even his disciples would have thought this would happen. And indeed, they're rather shocked and surprised when they see this. But out of that whole gospel, all of a sudden we realize that in that land of Samaria, there is a woman and a Samaritan who becomes the very first evangelist proclaiming that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And last week, we have the story of the man born blind and Jesus smearing mud on his eyes and going to wash in the pool of Siloam and coming back with his height received. And the grumbling in the background of those Pharisees who sees him as a sinner for having done a compassionate thing on the Sabbath, as if those two things could possibly be brought together. And a rather outrageous thing for us to understand because we don't see that in our way today. But nevertheless, it becomes a touchstone of what faith is all about. And when at the end the Pharisees say, we see, Jesus says, no, you don't, and that's the problem. You only see that which you think is your tradition, and in the middle of that tradition there is something new going on. And so now we reach the fullness of John's move toward Jesus and toward Jerusalem and his final end. We have this story of Lazarus, friends of Jesus along with his sisters Mary and Martha. And on their way, the message comes that Lazarus is ill and Jesus doesn't move very fast. He's, he tarries. He says he sticks around for a while. And as they get further and further in, <coughs> Martha comes forward with this proclamation. Had you been here, he would not have died. And so Jesus says, I am the resurrection, and I am life. And the same thing comes to Mary when she comes out and pleads her cause. And as they move closer to the tomb, this rather astounding thing happens where Jesus breaks down and cries. And the question is, is he crying over the death of Lazarus? After all, he's going to raise him from the dead. Or is he crying for the basic human factor that we are all mortal? <coughs> And that the man he loved is claimed by death, the very thing that puts an end to every hope and every desire and every person. And so he cries. And some look at him and say, wow, look at that, how much he loved him. And then as always in the background is the negative. Could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? In the midst of everything that's going on, the Samaritan woman, the blind man who sees, still there is the one thing in the background that this can't really be who he thinks he is. And so he says, take away the stone, and he looks up and he prays to the God he calls his father, and he says, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. 
And then he calls Lazarus out and he says to the people, unbind him, let him go, set him free. We have been brought up to think about resurrection as something that comes after who we are as mortals after we die. And even the story of Lazarus seems to point that out. But common sense tells us even the resurrected Lazarus is going to die. And that mortality that sits out in front of us is what scares the heck out of all of us. We who love and then lose the people that we love oftentimes ask ourselves, is the pain worth it? And in this story, as we get closer next Sunday to Palm Sunday, when everybody is giving Jesus the hurrah and the waving of the palms and all the hosannas, on the other side of that story is the force of evil that is getting stronger and stronger day by day. Because behind every force of love, there is too often the force of that which wants to destroy it, that wants to bring it down and say, no, you won't win. Love is not going to win. And so in the resurrection story of Lazarus is not only a man who is resuscitated or brought back to life, but that unusual ending that seems common except it hits hard. And he says to the people, unbind him and let him go. And so the question arises, is there more to resurrection after death? Or is resurrection something that's now? Does it define who we are as, quote, pre-resurrection type of people? Where we look out into the world and see it for what it is. That it is broken. That you look out there and you see what people do to other people. When you look out into different lands and you see people in a famine, and all of a sudden it's difficult to get them water or food, why should that be difficult? Or is evil the triumph of what these people could look forward to? Or is there a group of people who understand what present day resurrection could possibly be? And when those people understand it deep down in their heart, they understand that we must reach out, we must resurrect the spirits of those people. When we feed, we unbind them and we let them go. When we care for them, we unbind what holds them down to the earth and drives them into the dust. We need to unbind them. When we come into this church and we say those words of confession and forgiveness, we are unbinding who we are, who we presume ourselves to be, and see ourselves as the children of God that have come back. To hear the words of saying, my children, come on. Hear my words of forgiveness. There is in this world an awful lot of unbinding that needs to be done. It's in the blindness of those who grumble in the background, well, why didn't he save him? Like he gave him sight to the blind man. Or why can't he do for us what he did back then in these stories? Why in the midst of all our sickness can't we pray to the same God and say, do for me what you did for Lazarus? But at this point, we are the people who see the story after the fact, aren't we? And what we're called to do is to be children of resurrection. That at any given time, we test our lives over and against what we see in the world and say, what do resurrected people in their minds do in terms of what they see in the world and what they are called to do if we call ourselves that nice little catchword, Christian? And when we grab that whole world and we take that word into our minds, something is transformed. Transformation is a form of resurrection. The mind is resurrected and brought into a new life. So as we get closer and closer to Palm Sunday, and we fill the whole world with our hosannas, knowing full well because we are children of a different later generation of what's going to come, you have to hold close to yourself that idea that love is going to win. And when love wins, we are the people that are called to be on that side. That despite everything, for a long time, for a long three days, the disciples and everybody who loved Jesus thought, it's over. It's over. And yet the story goes on through the centuries and through the ages and says, oh no, it's not. 
there are people who grasp hold of resurrection now. And when they do, they simultaneously unbind their minds to something open and new as to who they relate to in this world. And in the unbinding of their own mind, they reach out and they remove the bindings of blindness of a body that refused to move and reach out to its brother and sister. And at any given time, Every church has to test itself and what it does, not just on a Sunday morning, but as it walks out through the week, as it does its planning, and says, how shall we, who know that resurrection is not just after we are gone, but it's here, and it's right now. And every program, every thought, every idea that goes beyond ourselves, we remove another binding from our own eyes. And as we reach out to the other people, some type of binding is taken from them. And that is how it all works, folks. Every church is called to be a resurrected community, even when it's in sorrow, even when it thinks there's no way out of this. You grab onto the hope, and you run with it as best you can. So as we approach Palm Sunday and Holy Week, as we look into Holy Thursday and see Jesus gathering his disciples, when we walk into the very darkness of Good Friday, there is that sense almost that the world can't be unbound. But just wait. It only takes three days for something to happen that nobody ever would have expected. The resurrection, not just of Jesus, but for a whole tribe of people that are yet to be unborn, who will hear that story and ask, unbind me, Lord. Take away my blindness and help me to walk my own resurrected life, even before that final day when you call me and to do what your Father calls his kingdom. God grant us this grace as we walk into Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and the, the, the day of Easter, to think very carefully what it means for us to be unbound and to lead lives that are not a resurrection grace to walk.